Okay, I'll call the meeting to order uh, the public session. Please stand for the statement of Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, uh, I don't think anyone signed up yeah. for residents' comments. Uh, so we'll move on to consensus agenda items. Quick presentation. Is there a seat? On the online version. Okay, let her see. Oh, all right, we'll, right. we'll have it right here then. Go ahead. Okay, great. Um, I'd like to call on uh, Allison Davis to do a quick presentation. Um, what's it? No. Yeah, please. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to work with PowerPoint? That's uh, about the presentation on presentation on equalization rates. Good evening. Tonight, I'm going to do a little presentation on equalization rates and hopefully educate um, some of you on how this works. So I'm, I'm calculating the tax rates. We can go through some of this. So the equalization rate formula is basically the total assessed value of the municipality divided by the total market value of the municipality. That equals the rate of the equalization. Here are some examples. So. If your equalization rate is 100, it means the town is assessing you at 100% of market value. Most likely a reassessment was done in recent years and your property's assessment is roughly the same as its market value or the price for which you get if you sell your property. If the equalization rate of the town is less than 100, the property in the town is assessed less than market value. So the lower the equalization rate, the longer it has been since a reassessment has taken place. An example is an equalization rate of 43 means the overall property in the town is assessed at 43% of market value. So when you sell your house, you could sell it for 43, you could sell it for more than 43%. Your assessment is 43% of that sales value. If the equalization rate is greater than 100, the overall property in the town is assessed higher than the market value and property values may have decreased since the last assessment, assessment, but assessments were not adjusted downward. Why are equalization rates necessarily, necessarily necessary in New York State? Um, each municipality determines its own level of assessment. Um, in contrast to other states where there's one level of assessment statewide. There's in New York State hundreds of taxing jurisdictions and most school districts and counties share same, the same taxing boundaries as the cities and towns that are responsible for assessing the properties. So equalization rates are necessary to equalize the taxes across the towns or the taxing jurisdiction. In order to distribute school district or county taxes among multiple municipalities, the level assessment must be equalized to the full market value so that the taxes are, are equally distributed. So that means uh, you take the total assessed value of your municipality divided by the equalization rate for the entire municipality, and that equals the full value of the municipality. If, and if all municipalities were assessed at 100% of market value, then equalization rates wouldn't be necessary because it would all be equal. Uh, once the full market value of each municipality is determined, the school district or county can determine how much in taxes should be collected from each of the municipalities. And this just, uh, uh, the Department of Taxation and Finance states that uh, of most of New York State's more than 700 school districts distribute their taxes among several municipalities, many of which have different levels of assessment. The number of municipal segments in a school district ranges from one to as many as 15. The Niagara Wheatfield School District has four municipalities, four towns within district boundaries. And I've listed here the towns and the equalization rates. 
So what that says is for every one of those towns, because it's below 100%, that your sales value or your market value is greater than your assessed value. Just to be clear, equalization rates do not correct unfair assessments within a municipality. So they measure the level of assessment for the entire municipality. They're not intended to correct unfair assessments in a city or town. That would be something you'd have to go back to your assessor to um, fight. And usually in municipalities, there are forms that you fill out and there's a, a, pro a process to follow. The assessor has a primary role in ensuring the fairness of the individual assessments. The more frequently properties are reassessed based on current market values, the more likely it'll be the assessments are fair. Property owners also have a role to ensure that their individual assessments are fair. And again, if you feel your assessment isn't uh, valid or correct, you go, there's a process usually listed on the town's website whereby you file, a, a, usually it's a form, a reassessment evaluation form, and then there's a process each town follows. Okay, equalization rates are based on local data. So the assessment roles include the municipal level of assessment typically listed as a uniform percentage of value. Equalization rates are determined by an analyzing that level of assessment. And based on national standards, the assessor's offices they're talking about here review the level of assessment to determine if it's within adequate tolerances to be used as the equalization rate. And then they go on to say, in municipalities where they can't confirm the level of assessment, they use their own independent estimate of total market value to determine the equalization rate. Equalization rates are all set by the local municipalities, all set by the towns and the assessor's offices. Um, other uses of equalization rates, they're used to establish tax and debt limits, uh, allocation of costs, uh, for other operations within the municipality, determination of state assessments, and you can read the list going down there. Uh, determination of level of star exemptions, which does uh, relate to school district tax taxes, apportionment of sales tax and revenues, and uh, the assessment and equity and small claims assessment review hearings. So here's an example. If school district AB needs to raise a million dollars through property taxes, so they have a levy of a million dollars, and the district contains all of town A and all of town B, so 100% of town A and 100% of town B. Each town has a total assessed value of $10 million. The $1 million levy, if the levy were allocated on the basis of the assessed values, the taxpayers would be split evenly. So they each pay $500,000 because each has a total assessed value of $10 million. However, the two towns have two different levels of assessment. Town A has an equalization rate of 33.33 and Town B has an equalization rate of 50%. And I, just so you know, I changed in the formula the 33.33 to 30 to make it a little easier. So here's the formula that they use. So you take the assessed value of each town, which is $10 million, and the equalization rate, and you multiply that. So 10 million times 0.3 is $30 million. So that's the market value for town A. And the market value for town B is 10 million times 0.5 or 50%, which is 20 million. So the total market value of A, B together is $50 million. And the percent of market value and the percent of levy then would be 60% for town A and 40% for town B. So that, that is, that percent, percentage is uh, calculated by dividing $30 million, the market value of the town, divided by the total of both towns to come up with 60%. Uh, yeah, sure. Yes. Where do you get the uh, uh, market value of the town? Who creates it? The market value of the town is um, from the assessor's office. We get the list of the, the um, market values and the assessed values from the towns. So it's the assessor's office and I think they develop those uh, dollars based on local sales and stuff. Now the, the, uh, the uh, equalization rate, we'll just say 50%. Mm -hmm. Based on the sale of homes in a particular community, could that fluctuate? Or would that be a question? The equalization rate? Yeah, the 50%. 
No. The equalization rate is basically based on the assessments, the town's assessments. So if the town assessor is not assessing the property annually or often, it affects the equalization rates. But is that a moving number? Yeah, every year it changes, yes. Based on the number of new assessments. Correct. So it could be 60% and then uh, it could go down. The and, and, and Rick, maybe, maybe, to your, maybe to your question, dealing with home sales, very often when you have home sales, there's some reassessment. So when if you have that change of return over, it could be affecting the in that the market way, value. Correct. correct. Yeah, because there's uh, we're just saying that community. There's been a lot of homes that went for sale, sold much higher than they're assessed. So because of that, that assessed that equalization rate could fluctuate. Um, the market value would fluctuate. Yes, yeah, so it would affect the. Correct, yes, the equalization rate. Okay. Yeah, the change in the town's total market value relative to other towns can cause the town's share of the levy to increase or decrease. So if one municipality's market value increases, but all the other municipalities in the taxing jurisdiction increase to a larger degree, then the first municipality's share of the tax levy will decline because they're not being raised at the same rate. But the, the point of equalization is to equalize everything. Correct. But then we feel town of Niagara, I'm assuming, right? Correct, like that's this. correct. Okay, so if, if whatever community is assessed for 100%, and there's a $200,000 home in that community. The other community is assessed for 60%, a $200,000 home. Would they still be paying the same school tax? No, probably not because the equalization rate is different in the one town than the other, which affects the tax ca uh, rate calculations. And that's why up to date assessments is something that you know, 10 people are going to push for. And the way you'll see that is if you look at what the that one part of the slide where it says how much per thousand assessed value uh, in, in the equalization way, where one was $60 per 1,000, the other one was $40 per 1,000. Right. That, that'll show you right there a $100,000 home, you're going to have one paying $600 and one paying $400 in each of the communities. So yeah, the same the same home that's, that has the same um, market value um, or same assessment assess value will not have the same. They won't have the same tax rates. Level. So they're equal. It's, it's not actually equalized. The equalization rate in the, the way that we learned when I did the fiscal um, the fiscal management training, uh, Sue Villiers explained it to us really well. That he said, just to think of this, it's not the houses equalizing our each between each community. It's the, the entire share right. that each of the communities the pay towns. for those there. So you're equalizing the towns, not the right. houses, Correct. the individual taxpayers. Correct. And then, and then the changes in assessment within your town will affect the amount that you pay within your town. Correct. But not compared to the others. Right. So, so the town with a lower equalization rate, say 50%, would have a more of a school tax increase than something that's at 100%? Not, not necessarily, necessarily, not necessarily. It depends the on, market, there's the so many other factors, right? The town. Within the town itself also matters. So like if your market value goes up within the town, that affects the rate. If your assessments are changed, that affects the rate. There's like a, a whole bunch of things. It's not just town to town, it's within the town too. Right. Was, so once the town's share is, once the town, each town's share of the levy is is uh, assigned or calculated, then within that town, the rate is determined on the, the assessment uh, assessed values of the properties. I give you an example. It was about six years ago. All three of the towns, Cambria, Lewiston, and Wheatfield, had a tax increase. And because of the equalization rate, there was actually a decrease in the town of Niagara by a couple dollars per thousand. 
And so when, you know, when that happened, people's, the tax share, uh, the tax burden, I would say from that one town was obviously decreased for each person uh, versus the, the other, the other town towns. Um, yeah, you know, and so it's been all over the place. I know there was a year that wheat fields was almost triple what the you know increase with versus us in the other one. So um, it all depends again on that assessment and and that market share that's going on. And I'm you know, right now I know the thing is method. I, I remember listening to Tom Board and we feel like what a lot of these homes are selling way above market value right now. You know, there's you know if there's a sale. Um, if neighbors down the street, one of the you know there's there's got into a bidding war on the first day they put it up and. They, they they went for fifty thousand above what their asking price was. Um, I still don't know how you get a mortgage for that, but because the banks are taking a major risk, but um, yeah, that so that, that'll affect the full market value right. of yeah. the properties, which in turn will affect. So that the, town could then have a greater share of the tax work in if you have four in our case, four municipalities, right? They, they, and if that was happening throughout that particular town. They would have they would have a greater share um, to pay. Correct. Yes. Does that, does that I, help? I have. I right, thank you. A little, little bit more afterwards. Chosen yes, and I, I forget for tax assessors too. It's a combination yes. of what you say and what they say. Thank you, Allison. You're welcome. All right, um, moving along on here then, uh, I'd call for a motion to accept the consensus agenda items as submitted. So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed or abstaining? Motion carries. All right, call for a motion to accept the personnel items as submitted. So moved. There's second. Second. We're moving seconded. Anything to separate or discuss? All right, then all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed or abstaining? Motion carries. All right, Capital Project Committee. I was hoping we could uh, select a date for the Capital Project Committee to meet. Um, we can meet and go over where we are with the current uh, project uh, phase one at Curriculum and then and, and the timeline that we've been established now for phase two. Um, a couple of dates I was thinking if we were trying to do them before a board meeting, maybe around five o'clock, either on October 7th or one on the 4th. Like Can we do the later date just because the way things are with opening schools and things getting, it's, it's a little crazy right now. Does that work with two leaders? Yeah, well, what's that? November 4th. I think Bob's also on that. Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll send something out then. Okay. All right, policy committee. Um, we had a meeting prior to this meeting. Went over what we have five or six policies that will be uh, ready to be uh, next meeting. Um, I had a question. Actually, I'll go to Dan with this if you don't mind. Thank you. All right. Uh, there was a, a general question um, through the board presence forum on NISBA asking about how we've adjusted. Um, technology policies uh, with, with, with in rise of COVID, and do we do any adjustments or with with, with you know, personal personal device use, personal cell phone? This is just a category they listed. Personal cell phone use, um, you know, obviously kids use uh, and staff use of those things. So we didn't have anything in our policy that prohibited that. So we practice wise, we've allowed for it. Um, but I think a couple of important things um, that. We've done the done this group actually was um, allowing us to move up the purchase of our devices um, that should be coming in in November, beginning of December. That's the, I think, an additional 600 devices for the district that are very important. Um, we, we've also added um, hotspots uh, to, to some of our families, particularly uh, on the test for nation and, and boosters. So, those are some things that, you know, practice wise, we've changed. We haven't had to change anything. Um, policy-wise. That said, last year, we, we may have had to, if last year we didn't add that digital citizenship piece to our code of conduct, which I think was you know, very important. That's something that we can draw upon now when, um, uh, when we face this challenge of everybody being online again. Any questions? 
All right, we have a couple items for informational there. Uh, the soccer booster club fundraisers. Can I just ask you to make a comment about the other committee and just remind people that it's only October 7th? Sure, October 7th audit committee. Who are my audit members? Nelson's buying some smiley cookies, she'll freeze them for that meeting. Uh, informational items, we have the two soccer um, soccer booster club meeting uh, item, and soccer booster club fundraiser items there, car wash on the 26th, and raffle ticket sales from 23rd to the 10th, or, 20, or 23rd to 23rd of, the, of September, October. Uh, early graduation informational item that's also listed there. All right. Um, I'd like to have our superintendent introduce our ex officio, our new ex officio board member. It is uh, my pleasure to introduce Marissa Zarconi, uh, who will be our uh, student liaison to the Board of Education this year. It's a crucial role. We talked about it a little bit earlier. It is um, an opportunity for all of us, uh, the particular board, to get some insight into um, what our students are experiencing throughout the course of the year. I don't think there's ever been a year that's been, um, and I know there isn't more unusual than this one since I've been in education. So the student perspective on, perspective on all these things is really important, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So next meeting you'll have to give a report. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and for, you know, reading purposes uh, for some of the old guys here, they want it double spaced, so they big type. <laughs> Tell kidding. her you're kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. I'm kidding. Um, I'll just move on with my report then. Uh, I want to say that it's been uh, obviously an interesting opening across the entire state with schools, let alone just in the individual districts. Um, I, I want to say that is uh, this has not been an easy time for obviously you know, not just administrators, but teachers and support staff with the amount of changes that have gone on here. Um, and and I, I concur after talking to many parents, they just said that this is not, not, not the effort that we're putting forth as a school district uh, with the education, but just the model. They said this is just not the model that is something to be permanent after all this abnormal time ends. Um, and we know that the governor had made a, uh, made remarks that, you know, hey, we got technology, we can go online, why do we need to have you know so many teachers in schools and so on. Any person in education that thinks that this is a good idea to continue past the COVID you know, time really shouldn't be in education. This this is not this is not the way to educate children. It, 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 I made a comment um, a few months ago that said that there's a reason why the online schools, the virtual online schools that you know are advertised on TV and you hear about in other states um, are not done here is because they don't work. It is not a great model for kids to learn on. And I, I really feel bad for, you know, some of the, some of the kids that are, are sitting there in the computer for uh, you know, hours on end on those other days to, um, to, to sit and learn. And the teachers have done, um, you know, they, they have worked the, probably the hardest in, in years in preparation of not planning their lessons, but learning new technology in a very short period of time. I know that people keep saying, why you had six months to prepare for this why aren't we more prepared it's not that's not the, the problem the problem with it is is that you cannot foresee all the issues when you fully use a software package or a technology package um that is going to occur when you have everyone using it and having everyone ref, you know give feedback um in the form of uh you know either video interaction or or, or lessons coming back in um of what's going to happen there it takes a lot of trial and error and I, um, I talked to a couple of the newer teachers, uh, not just in our district here, but also my own district that I teach in. I said, hey, what's the college prep programs looking like right now? And they said, we get one technology class. And in, in today's day and age, you, you just can't have it. I mean, technology is, um, granted the, the virtual component of it is it's not the norm, but the use of technology in the classroom um, with, it, with you know, very emergent technologies of the smart boards, projectors, um, you know, it's no longer just a, Back like what he taught, uh, you know, a uh, a uh, you know an overhead projector, or you know, uh, uh, maybe when Forcucci was in the classroom with the um, the Ditto machine, um, you know. So, you know, the, the, yeah. So I mean, technology has obviously moved past that point, and I, 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 I really worry that with these the educators that they're producing, that they, you know a lot of the college prep programs really need to take a hard look at what they're doing with this with, during COVID right now, and say, 
we need to rethink things. Um, it goes back to my own personal view. This is not with board that anyone who is a professor in a college prep program, there's no reason that if you have not been in a college or in a classroom teaching for 20 years, you shouldn't be there preparing teachers because it's you don't have the experiences and everything that go on and and to, to really prepare them for um, for teaching. And we, I mean, we, we had a handful of teachers, and they're just like, okay, nothing nothing prepared us for any of this. You know, just, just your normal classroom management has gone out the window. Um, one of the things I talked to the superintendent about um, over the course of the past month or so was um, what our our um, Secretary of Education for for the uh, for the country has uh, put forth with her own rule version for the CARES Act funding, and um, I know that we were very happy that when there were two federal judges, one in D.C. and one in Oregon, that um, that over that uh, put a stay on her rules that were created on there. And if you don't know what that is, that that piece of it is, is that she changed the formulaic. Um, the normal formula that Congress puts out for sharing federal funds. And so instead of it being at, you know, with it based on poverty, going to private institutions for those schools, those students that are in poverty ratios, she's saying that it was for all students, the money. And basically for some states, it turned it into the flip the ratio of 75% going to public school, 25 private to 25% public school, 75 private. And um, they, they, I, I just the other day, and I know we had this from this, but also that you know the the judge in D.C. overruled that said it's not what Congress intended. Um, I didn't have a chance to talk to you yet. How if you know because I know that we got the guidance out from the state about that. And how did how did that affect us with did it change things you know greatly with like with our share? We we haven't seen that in the, the, those numbers yet. Okay. Um, so it'll probably be in the next round if if, if we see it impacted. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know. I think that the, the, that whole idea of this next round of funding that um, the uh, that Congress is uh, pushing back and forth about um, is a real concern because one of the things that the Secretary of Education um, remarked was that she really wanted the funding to only go out in the form of voucher payments, which is a very, very um, concerning thing. Which is actually, in New York State, is really interesting because we don't offer vouchers in any form in any district across the state. So, you know, the question is then, do we get, would we get any funding whatsoever uh, in that regards? Uh, so, it, I'm glad that, you know, as of right now, those, those the rules that she had instituted are uh, are being overturned. overturned. Uh, but again, I worry about anything that does come in the future with that. And that's why I always, um, you know, no matter what side of the aisle that you're on, um, it seems like both sides right now are fighting the, the Secretary of Education with funding and stuff. And we need to make sure that we are lobbying um, not just our own uh, representatives from our area, but you know both both um, sides of, of the aisle to say, hey, listen, when you make a rule from in the Senate or in the, in the House uh, with your with your acts, make sure that it's upheld and not added a, 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 the, you know, the Secretary doesn't just add her own rules to it um, and hope to slip it through. That being said, I want to uh, move it over to the superintendent. Thank you. Uh, quick, quick report on athletics. Uh, athletics are scheduled to begin on September 21st. Um, there's certainly been some information that's been put out by our athletic department. There's more information coming. Uh, but again, I think we were all holding our breath to see if uh, athletics were really going to start. They will. Um, certainly, some sports have been moved back um, to a March 1st date. Um, I, I was talking with some board members before the meeting tonight. I think you can look at that possibly as an opportunity. Uh, there's an opportunity maybe to play additional some sports that you couldn't play both of or the sports before. Um, so, um, some students who perhaps before made the choice between, let's say, football and soccer could potentially help play both. And uh, that's certainly a unique. Very, very unique opportunity that you know, usually doesn't present itself. Um, we are looking for districts out there to participate with us uh, and, and with our modified program. Uh, the NFL, I won't say all, but most of the other districts in the NFL are not going to be offering a modified program. So we're looking for some schools that we can compete with, have like directors of the program, and 
now. A uh, question was, was raised uh, to me about a cross country. We, um, we do have our own cross country course. We've used it in the past for um, our modified programs, but we haven't run our JV University programs on it. Um, at this point, we will. We, you won't have the um, multiple team meets, you'll just have dual meets. So we do have a, a course in which our students will be able to run on campus. Transportation, this is a big one. Um, we are, um, we're in need of drivers still. So if you know someone, if you would like to drive yourself and you're out there, please get a hold of our district. Um, you can get a hold of our HR office. You can go directly our director of transportation. If you have an interest, you want to talk a little bit about it. We held a job there recently and hired some, uh, some drivers there. But we do need more drivers. Um, we need drivers for two main reasons. One, we've had a number of retirees in the past month and month and a half in, in transportation. We also, and this is really important for everybody to know, we, we asked the community um, as part of the commitment forms, can you drive your children to school? Um, the response rate was very high. We were very excited about that. And that certainly impacted our, some of the decisions that we made with regard to the programs that we're able to run. Um, since then, there have been a number of people, a fairly large number of people, who have backed away from that commitment about driving and now are um, we're, you know, requiring us to transport. And it's put us in a position where the number of drivers that we needed just a month ago after the commitment form, um, it, it has changed significantly. And just, just to give you an idea, if we're talking about just at the elementary level, a shift of, let's call it 220 students, just for the sake of this argument, because it's about that. Um, a 220 student shift at 22 kids per bus means how many buses? 10, Ten. good, Ten. excellent. Um, th that's a lot of runs, right? Um, so we're scrambling to get that ready for next week, Wednesday. Um, we'll be as creative as we need to be to make sure that we get, get all of our kids here. Um, but, but understand that, um, you know, that, that, that commitment piece is really important. And I say that not to call any parent out who all of a sudden needed transportation, but the answers that you gave um, informed our decisions. It informed how the types of programs that we knew we could run and set up. And I also say it because in a few weeks, we will be putting something else out for week 11 and beyond. And we're going to make, we need to make sure that the information that's provided is really accurate because that won't determine what kind of program we have remained for the year. Okay. Um, as far as reopening is concerned, I want to stress again of something about food service. When it comes to food service, until December 31st, for all of our buildings, for all of our students, breakfast and lunch is free. So if you are interested in taking advantage of that program, the district is reimbursed for those meals, we encourage you to do so, whether that means you come by and pick up the meals if you're not, um, if you're in the virtual program, or if you are not coming on the particular day because of your AB schedule, or if you're here. Students, when they come in in the morning, can get a breakfast every single morning at least until December 31st. Again, there's no cost of that okay, to our families. Any questions on any of that before we move forward? Um, talked about this at the last meeting, um, pre-K. The 20% reduction that the governor talked about is also currently included in the pre-K grant money that we received. A question was asked at this meeting last time uh, whether or not we could have families after the 10 weeks um, supplement the other portion of that. And the answer is yes. So in other words, could, could we allow the same number of families to continue not in essence have to close down the program and perhaps allow families to come up with the other 20% and stay in the program? The answer to that is yes. So that's going to take some more discussion here and we'll I'll put some stuff together maybe for our next meeting. Uh, 
if the state comes through and and the federal funds come through first, so the state comes through, and it goes back to 100 percent funding, then we wouldn't need to do that. But it is a way to keep all of the families involved without having to utilize any more of our dollars than what we have to use in this this ten week period. Okay. Um, on that 20% aid reduction, again, we spent quite a bit of time last time, so I don't want to reiterate too much, but I want you to know that it's still in play, that a 20% reduction in our district is a, you know, approximately seven and a half million dollars, significant dollars. The uh, uh, presidents of boards of education and um, superintendents have a legislative breakfast that right now is scheduled for the end of September. The goal of that will be to make sure that um, all of our legislators know the impact of that 20%. That's a real important component to that meeting. Okay. Yeah, did you say seven and a half million or seven hundred fifty thousand? So, so for the year, it's about seven and a half million dollars. For the year. For the twenty the twenty percent reduction of our state aid. And that um that's October fourth is the actual date for that legislative breakfast that we're we are actually hosting. Um, and I hope it is that day because that's the day that we sent to you. I hope we didn't even the wrong date and invite them the wrong day. Third, I thought it was. Was it third? Whatever that Saturday? Saturday is, yeah. That we Saturday. Oh, Saturday, Saturday third. third. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's, we're going to be hosting that. Um, and obviously, we're trying to do it outside, the simple fact that that way we can have. You know our entire board presidents and super and superintendents there along with the legislators instead of having the press but we do have a secondary place of moving inside if that if we need to um, and, and, and trust me we're, all the boards are on the same page right now with this because i mean how devastating this can be um with us we're about 50 would you say it's about 50 50 state aid to tax ratio right now pretty pretty close to that right yeah it's a, it look, it's a little less it's, it's less than it's less than 50. And he um, apparently said, well, I'm not going to state it. He wasn't going to hold back the 20% and the next payment due on the payments due. And that it wasn't a, it wasn't a, um, how did he say it? It wasn't a reduction, but a hold back basically on what they've done so far because he doesn't have the right to do that without legislative authority. So supposedly things are going to be uh, paid appropriately moving forward. I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah, and, and, and I would just comment too that it has been all along, I think the right word in it is withhold. That's what they've been calling it all along with the idea that we would never see it again. Concern all along. So, if, if, if all of that comes to fruition, that would be obviously great. That's what we've been hoping for all along. So. Right. Um, so, again, what I was getting at though is that there's a lot of districts that, you know, obviously we're meeting in this legislative breakfast that are a bit worse than we are. You know, you look at the falls, which is like an 80 to 20% ratio of state aid to, um, to, to test ratio. So, uh, you know, trust me, we're all, all the boards are on the same, the same page with that. Right, any questions for the superintendent on his report? All right. Um, items uh, for board discussion at this time. Uh, any old business? Anything new? Or quiet. Um, board member comments? I'd just like to welcome Marissa. Good luck to you. And uh, you'll enjoy it. And te Steve teased a lot, so like Julie said, just in, just go with the flow, but you'll do well. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, again, a thank you to our staff for the phenomenal opening so far. I, I know it's not easy um, in any regards to, <laughs> to to things going, sometimes going right. Um, you know, you, you could leave one, at the day thinking everything's all planned and I'll set to go the next day. And next day you come in and we were actually, I shouldn't say joking, but we were discussing that, you know, having a little laugh about what the one we have to deal with this, you know, you come in and the power's out. You know, it's now it's going to throw everything into, um, 
<laughs> it leads to a little chaos. Yeah. Uh, so it, it did. It, luckily, it came back on before we uh, had, to, had to get back uh, on, on, online. Um, I, I can't wait to hear what you're doing with snow days because, I mean, Allison loves calling snow days. And so um, with the new rules on snow days or option on snow days, as you say. Yeah, no, I think that's actually a good point to bring up. So, so what your stance is that we know there's now, uh, this year there's an island. So if, if we have a day when we have to close school, um, we would have the opportunity to offer you know, virtual remote learning on that day. And it wouldn't be a day that would count against us. It would have to be a day that would have to be made up. So, you know, I think particularly during this year, it makes good sense. But it could also, you know, potentially uh, be something that we utilize more snow days as we as we've known in the past we call it um it, it, it's very different well what, what would happen so the staff would come in so i i, I think there's two different scenarios um one in, in a well, let's say the bad weather unsafe roads you know one of those days that we have staff would, could, could stay home could have their students join them online could do some asynchronous and synchronous learning and that could be counted as a student attendance day if if on um when it, cold weather day you know so we to vote staff could come in they could teach from here but the students who, who normally maybe stand out for a bus they could be learning remotely from home now as for teachers what about like kitchen cleaners laborers buses so they like like currently where they would stay home on a day that you know, was a bad weather day, they have so many of those days that are actually account for in their contract. How is uh, I was going to ask that actually? How how has the um, the pickup for lunches been with the program? Uh, well, we've had approximately two hundred uh, people coming to get uh, meals uh, during the, during these days so far. Um, so it's, it's a lower number than before, and then, then we had going into the, even the summer. Um, but again, some of our students are here. So again, again, I, I want to stress I mean, the, the meals right now are all free for all of our students. So we really want families to, to, to utilize them, take advantage of that um, because they're, they're available. Uh, any other board member comments? These are so quiet. All right. Um, I'd like to call for a motion to adjourn then. Is there a second?